Hello and welcome to the Humans Invent Cycling Podcast. Today I am joined by Lionel Burney. Hello Lionel. Afternoon Richard. And by Orla Shinoui of Sky News. Sky Sports News, but we won't quibble. Hello. <laughs> Sorry Orla. <laughs> Uh, last time the three of us sat together was on top of Alpe d'Huez. Happy memories. Yeah, that's tour, doing the Tour de France. It was. It was a lovely evening, as I recall. This is a nice day as well. So it's a strong Tour de France unit that we've got out tonight. <laughs> Maybe not the strongest, but well-balanced, I feel. And we've got lots to talk about. We're going to talk a little bit about the Eneco Tour, which is going on at, at, as we speak, but we'll have finished by the time you hear this. Look ahead to the Vuelta. And uh, But first, Lionel, where are we? We are in Golden Square in central London just off Soho and Piccadilly and as you pointed out there's some kind of ping pong tournament going on in the square over there so it's all perhaps... very civilised really yeah. isn't it yeah the Humans Invent Cycling Podcast interviews and analysis we've got the big talking points covered argument is raging here we did a tennis podcast during the tour which was uh, subversive and now we're having a debate about whether it's ping pong or table tennis and Orla you're a bit of an expert on this <laughs> well I haven't seen what the guys are playing but there is a difference because I presented at the um, first world ping pong championships at Alexandra Palace in London in January so there is a difference between the two what is the difference the difference is essentially the kind of bat that they use so in table tennis they use a sponge bat and um, so it's very very fast um, um, whereas with ping pong, it's either sandpaper or it's essentially just a hard bat. So it's a little bit slower. Um, All right, this is enough. Right? <laughs> it's a really fun sport. I am an incredibly exciting person to have a cup of tea. All right, that's enough, Orla. <laughs> uh, let's, let's get on to cycling. Okay, so we just watched the uh, the time trial stage of the of the Eneco Tour. Sylvain Chavanel was the winner. Very impressive by him. But we're interested in time trial, I suppose, in the context particularly of the World Championships coming up in a few weeks in Florence. And we were we're interested in the performance of Bradley Wiggins. He won the, the big long time trial on the Tour of Poland a couple of weeks ago. That was very impressive. He was fifth today, you know, nine seconds down. It was a very technical, very twisty course, narrow roads. Uh, it wasn't perhaps uh, to his liking, but Lionel, were you surprised at that performance? I have to be honest. Um, he was he was starting so early in the time trial that he actually rode before the TV coverage started, certainly on Eurosport that, that I was watching. So didn't get a chance to see him, but he was top of the leaderboard for a long um, a long time until Jesse Sargent came through. And so I suppose when you saw that Jesse Sargent was the rider that beat him, um, perhaps the length of the course and the, the, the fact that it, whether it, it's always the same at the Eneco Tour, there's a lot of street furniture, narrow, um, tight corners cutting through little towns and villages and stuff so complete contrast to what he'll be facing at the world championships in uh, in, in italy which i gather is basically flat not technical at all and uh, much more going to be much more suited to him and i think with his kind of uh, bulking up for the time trial he's got the world championships in mind rather than the Eneco tour so i think he's just putting miles in the bank this week rather than focusing on trying to win it i was going to say as, as he's bulking up lionel you're slimming down you're a very slim line after the tour you've been is there a, is this theory that there's only so much weight in the world and as, as somebody <laughs> as one as it's re redistributed i think lionel's lionel some of lionel's girth has transferred to to bradley wiggins but does that mean that if Bradley Wiggins does go on to win the time trial world championships, we've essentially got Lionel to thank for it? <laughs> possibly, uh, uh, possibly. <laughs> this is, well, th this is assuming that the extra weight does actually give him an advantage in the time trial, which I'm not, I'm not convinced by. I just think, I just think it doesn't give him much of a disadvantage. But um, Orla, what are your thoughts about Bradley Wiggins? I think it's really interesting the way that he's clearly changing his focus, and I think it's not entirely surprising given the history of Bradley Wiggins' mentality and whatnot. If you think back to when he won the time trial at the Olympics last year, and he was very briefly the most decorated Olympian in British history, I remember when we all interviewed him afterwards, he said what he was most proud of wasn't the number of medals, but the range of disciplines across which he'd won it. So there was the individual time trial, the team time trial, medal in the Ma Madison, and then, of course, the, time, the individual team pursuit, time trial, sorry. and team pursuit, sorry. Um, and so he said that it was the range that made him most proud. It demonstrated just how varied an athlete he is. And he was never really going to be an athlete who's going to win the Tour de France over and over again, the likes of which we might see Chris Froome doing. So I think it's sensible for him to diversify. He doesn't like to repeat himself. We saw that whenever he decided to focus on the Giro. Didn't turn out exactly as he'd planned. But um, I think if he does go on to do well, win at 
the uh, time trial world championships the breadth of his palmares would be very very difficult to beat and would certainly put him in a special place in history and we all know how much he values the history books so I think it's it's quite interesting to see really it's interesting isn't it because I suppose the time trial will be viewed as by many as a as a sort of uh, um, consolation prize for the season he's not achieved what he set out to do which was to win the Giro I tend to look at the the weight gain which there has undoubtedly been if you see pictures of him at the moment he is noticeably heavier Um, he's more like the Bradley Wiggins of a few years ago who was pottering around the Tour de France not really sure what he was doing but he I I think it's more a case that he's not probably been able to maintain the, the discipline required to be a Grand Tour contender and that's completely understandable because from what I understand he had to make huge, huge efforts and huge sacrifices to get that weight off in the first place. It does I suppose raise the question about, you know, he is paid to be a Grand Tour rider. He's not paid to go to stage race and win the odd time trial Uh, and this does have implications perhaps for next year which is the final year of his contract. Uh, Will Sky be happy with him changing his focus in the way that he's done for the second part of this season? I think a wider point than that is that Wiggins a wider is, point, a I like wider it. Point than that is Wiggins <laughs> is um, he's the master of the grand statement, isn't he? If you remember after when he finished fourth in the tour, he said, "You'll never see me on the track again," and it's a very definite. You know, we didn't know whether to take that at face value or whether we'd see him turn up on the track. Now he, then he was, I'm a grand tour rider. Now he's not a grand tour rider. It's almost like he has to match his kind of shifting, shape shifting, and in a, in this sense, literally. Uh, He's shifting his shape, he's changing his focus, he's, and I think your point about the discipline required for a man of his kind of height and natural physique to maintain that super skinny weight for any, any period of time, because it's not just about slimming down for the Tour last year, the Giro this year, it's about maintaining a, a much lower um, level of weight all year round and, and as we've spoken to Nigel Mitchell um, which I'm sure you have as well the, the, the effort Team Sky the, nutritionist yeah, yeah. The, the effort required to stick to that all the time is uh, you know is huge it's, it's you know it's something that people don't really take um, they think the training is hard they think the training requires discipline and structure and focus but to actually be the right body shape as well and for Wiggins even more so simply because he's six foot and it's not three necessary if, if, you, if you're if you're focused on a time trial it's it's not that and, and this might be something that people I, I've, I've seen comments about you know the fact that clearly his time trial didn't suffer last year at the tour when he was super skinny um, but it, weight is not such a factor in a time trial as it is in the mountains no, but a time trial in the Tour de France is very different to a time trial in the World Championships where you know, they, they haven't been racing, particularly a, a time trial like the one he won at the end of the 2012 Tour, when everyone's on their knees, everyone's been through the mountains, everyone's you know, losing weight quicker than they can actually keep it on. Um, everyone's you know, just looking to get to the end of, end of the Tour. Um, Compared to an event where everyone's going to be bringing themselves up for a specific day, you know, Tony Martin is going to be peaking for that World Championship day just as much as Bradley Wiggins is. So when people sort of say, oh, well, how can Bradley Wiggins maintain uh, such a high level in time trials in Grand Tours when he's lost that weight? Well, he's already a very good time trialist and he's racing for the yellow jersey and you know, the, the, the other guys that perhaps are more time trial specialists have had to haul themselves through mountains, whereas he's, you know, at the, at the sharp end of the race. So it's kind of comparing apples and oranges, really. I think that's the key, really, when you think, if you mentioned Tony Martin, you think of the kind of riders he will be going up against at the Worlds. Tony Martin, Fabian Cancellara, they are slightly Taylor bulkier. Finney. Taylor Finney, indeed, he came forth at the Olympics last year. They, they don't have the slightness of frame that Wiggins of old had, but I think it's interesting when you talk about the discipline that's needed as well to maintain that grand tour form and I think it's not even so much the physical discipline for Wiggins it's also his life off the bike he is very much a family man he's talked about the sacrifices that it's taken in his personal life to be able to train at that level to get to that level of of fitness and and you know, get his body so lean and it does mean an awful lot of time away from his family and I'm not sure if that's got something to do with it he has said in the last couple of months you know, an enforced rest has made him reevaluate things, it's made him you know, think about his family life, think about what he really wants from things, but as you say Lionel, he is a master of reinvention really he does like to come out with grand statements that will contradict each other, so for now he might say, yeah, it's all about my life being centred off the bike as well as on it, and it's about the time trial, but next season who knows 
do we know yet, um, Orla, you've spent quite a bit of time with Chris Froome. Is Chris Froome just focusing on the road race at the World Championships? or I believe so, I believe so. I, I believe that the time trial team for Great Britain is Bradley Wiggins and Alex Dowsett, or at least that was what I heard the other day. Dowsett crashed out of the Enico Tour the other day and managed to dislocate both thumbs. Now, I actually te- I texted uh, Alex Dowsett this morning. You'll be waiting uh, for the uh, And then I, I, thought, I thought afterwards, I thought afterwards, uh, texting a man who's dislocated both thumbs is perhaps not the wisest thing to do. Can I just say, Richard, that's a great excuse for not getting a reply. It is. Sorry, I dislocated both thumbs. I'm going to remember that one. Uh, no, the, the idea was to try and get an interview with him, actually, for this podcast. So that may appear if he, if he manages to text me back with his four fingers or pinky, some combination of working fingers fingers so Alex Dowsett would 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 perhaps be a decent shot I mean Froome said at the tour on the final day of the tour that he didn't fancy the the world's time trial he really wants to go for the the road race I mean it's interesting will Bradley Wiggins be riding the road race um perhaps not but uh, can they, they've got nine riders in the race can they, they they can bring in another nine can't they they don't have they don't have to double up well there's also the what sort of lineup will Sky put in the team, team time, time trial? trial? Well, not Bradley Wiggins, obviously, because he'll be riding the Tour of Britain. So, oh, all cool. sorts of all sorts of permutations. Mm-hmm. Let's wrap up this little section by doing a peddler de charme. The reason mainly is that we just want to hear from Chiro again. And now peddler de charme. So that was Chiro. Uh, thank you, Chiro, and we'll be meeting Chiro again in Florence in a few weeks. Looking forward to that. I know. I know he is. So Peddler de Charme. Well, my nomination. Uh, Sylvan Chavonel was very good today in the time trial, uh, but my nomination is uh, Arno Demar, who won the the race in London a couple of weeks ago and absolutely spanked Philip Gilbert the other day in the Enico Tour on an uphill finish, which Gilbert would have dominated a couple of years ago. And Gilbert's not won a race yet as world champion, uh, and. That, that, that's pretty, I don't think anybody would have expected that, he's having a pretty dismal season, unless he can somehow pull it out of the bag at the Worlds again, but I think it's probably too hilly for him, but Demar is my peddler de charme, only 21 that's probably his biggest win stage of the Enico Tour uh, and he, he won really in, in style it was very similar to the London race actually where Alfredo once again was on the attack in the closing stages, but Demar won a, a brilliant uphill finish Lionel, any uh, peddler de charme for you? Well I'm going to nominate Gilbert as peddler sans charm in that case and I'm going to ask the question of whether as world champion whether he's still charging for interviews <laughs> it's a very good question he was for a brief while charging for interviews Orla any uh, peddler de charm for you I would have to say that given that the last race I went to was um, one of the Dutch crits ah we're going to get on to that but um, I think the fact that Chris Froome won there after <laughs> After winning the Tour de France, I mean, that was quite something, wasn't it, to have that kind of form? <laughs> we did talk about this in the last podcast, actually, which you clearly haven't listened to, which, which is really poor research on your part. We, did, we briefly touched on the post-tour crits and how um, it was remarkable that Chris Froome carried that form after three weeks of the Tour into these... Not just that, but, you know, he's clearly a threat for the green jersey with that kind of sprinting form <laughs> next year. I would have thought Cavendish would probably be worrying a bit that Froome... Stick him on the track. Put him in the team sprint. <laughs> Why not? Still time for Rio. Put him in the team sprint. So, Orla, we wanted to talk to you, actually, about because you, you travelled uh, from the tour to Holland, I think, yeah. uh, and you travelled around with, with, with the Froome family yes. uh, and, uh, and, and experienced some of those post-tour crits, which I must say I've never actually been to. Uh, and I'd be curious to know what the atmosphere was like, what, what the events were like, and was it obvious that it was rigged? <laughs> rigged? How dare you? Um... It was pretty much as you'd expect. Bonkers, brilliant, uh, mental, uh, everyone just there for a really good time. It was interesting to see uh, Chris Froome and his approach to it all because everyone knows how calm he is, how measured he is. And and people, I think before the tour, were wondering, does he get excited about this kind of thing? Does he enjoy it? And he was clearly really enjoying himself and able to relax and, and let go a little bit. Uh, the crowds just go crazy. You basically turn up. I feel sorry for anyone else who's racing that day because you turn up for the one I went to anyway. Uh, it starts at midday and the streets are essentially empty all day long until the male pros come along. And then the streets are lined, the beer is flowing, they have the most ridiculous, and I hope the Dutch won't be offended, the most ridiculous Dutch um, live music all through the evening. Um, 
and it's just a great, great party. It's great fun. And uh, yeah, I think they really enjoyed it. I think for the likes of Frim as well, it's fairly well known he's not one of the biggest students of the history of uh, cycling. And so I'm not really sure if he quite knew what to expect. I think the night before in Belgium in particular, which um, himself and Richie Port went to uh, the day after the tour finished, they were absolutely bombarded uh, with fans. And I think they were quite taken aback by that. He didn't quite know that he was going to get that. And I don't think either he realised that he was going to get so much support. And I think that's, you know, fairly understandable given the pressure he was under at the Tour de France and the questions that were asked of him. It was a really, really supportive, I wouldn't say partisan crowd, although possibly that's the way it was, but everyone I spoke to uh, on the way there, while I was there, people at the hotel, taxi drivers, everyone was full of praise for Froome, said that he was a breath of fresh air, it's what cycling needs. And I think that was probably quite welcome for him to have that kind of a welcome, given the tour that he had. So it was essentially just great fun. And yeah, he managed to win as well. Uh, I mean, we know that traditionally riders have gone and ridden these races for, for the money. Mm. Do you, did you, do you have any idea what, what these days a, a Tour de France winner is paid to ride these events? And do you know why he, why he went and rode so many of them? Because, um, you know, he, he doesn't need the money, really. I mean, surely a Tour winner these days makes his money from sponsorship and a, and an, a better contract. I mean, did you, did you have a sense about why he chose to ride so many of these races? Well, I asked him and he gave what's probably a fairly safe answer and said that it's a great opportunity to enjoy racing again after the pressure of the Tour de France, to get out there with the fans and celebrate with them. And also because he's still racing, he's gone to Colorado, he obviously has the World Championships coming up. And so he said he wanted to keep his legs ticking over. It wasn't just about doing the crits for the sake of doing the crits, but it was a case of keeping the legs ticking over in a way that maybe he wouldn't have done if he was simply training. Whether you believe that or not, I don't know. But um, he said that it was for the fun, but also the added bonus of the training. So. And what about the money? Do we know what riders earn these days from the crits? I th I heard something in the... Re well, tens of thousands anyway. Right. Um, for a tour winner, I've heard something in the region of 50 thousand probably worth it then mm. you know even if you are on a couple of million contracts you wouldn't probably. turn it down no matter how much money you had would you really no you wouldn't you wouldn't i wouldn't um no um you definitely you, would. <laughs> i definitely i definitely <laughs> no uh, you saw you now let's not let's not <laughs> let's not go there orla uh, we've got an englishman a scottishman and an irish woman that here we, sort of the, a really we, bad we, joke, we could it? we could go into, into a few jokes um <laughs> Now, you saw Chris Room a, a couple of days ago as well. He was in the UK, did a bit with, with Sky, I think. He gave an interview to the Mail on Sunday. I believe that's the only newspaper that's got an interview with the man, the Evening Standard. He, in, it, in it, he revealed his uh, favourite drink, is Bailey's. He got, he got drunk on the night of the tour. Uh, he couldn't get Bailey's, so he drank tequila. I did and, witness uh, that first time. You did witness that, right, okay. Um, and, uh, but generally, what, what was your impression of him now, a couple of weeks on? How, how uh, He was over with Michelle Count, his fiancée. They, they've probably been swamped because she's also his manager. And I just wonder, what's your sense of how they're kind of coping with this new reality that they're, that they're living in now? I think they're both really enjoying it. I think that Chris is starting to relax into it as well. Um, he hasn't been typically forthcoming with the media and I don't mean that in any negative way, it's somebody that he hasn't needed to, he hasn't had the attention for the last couple of years and so I think it's taken him a while to get used to it and to, as I say, relax into it because if you sort of have a chat with him off the bike, a drink or two, then you know he's really chatty and, and witty and funny and I think that he's maybe struggled to get that persona across but I think he is now starting to do that and even he did a Q&A session at Sky headquarters and even as the session went on he started to relax a little bit and tell anecdotes and I think he's very conscious as well of trying to connect with um, the British public in particular and that's the reason that they came over really to um, I suppose maximise the yellow jersey but also to reiterate that he does despite the fact that he was born and grew up in Africa and has never lived here, he does feel very British. And um, I think that once people start to see that side of him, then they will warm to him an awful lot. But, yeah, I do think they are really enjoying it so far. And, um, yeah, he's growing into it an awful lot. 
the big thing for Chris is going to be next year's tour, starting in Yorkshire. I think that's when he's going to realise that you know he has, he has got a lot of fans here, and that that will be his time. I think from the point of view of the media, he, it's, he was a bit of a slow burn. Um, I remember writing for the Sunday Times back in February that Chris Froome won the tour of Oman and that was his first step towards following Bradley Wiggins' footsteps to the tour and they were a bit unsure, like, well, are you sure? I mean, you know, is he really... Is he, yeah, I know he was second last year, but is he really the real deal? And, and I think that's the same with the public. I'm not sure that they necessarily understood that he was going to be at quite such a high level and was going to win the tour and it will be next year when it starts in Yorkshire... There'll be huge numbers of British fans there. Um, he'll be the defending champion, and that will be the moment when his, his profile really takes off here, I think. The Humans Invent Cycling Podcast. For more articles, go to humansinvent.com slash cycling. So just, I mean, just looking ahead briefly to Vuelta, because we'll do another Vuelta podcast as that race gets underway, and we'll obviously uh, talk about it a lot during the race. But it, it's a very mountainous route this year. Um, I think uh, of the riders that have been announced so far, Roman Kreuziger is leading quite a strong-looking Saxo team. He was very strong at the Tour, probably one to watch. I'm not sure if such a mountainous route will, will favour him, but obviously Alessandro Valverde is perhaps a favourite. You know, he rode very well at the Tour. He had one, one bad day, still managed to finish about seventh overall, I think. He was certainly up there in the top ten. Um, so he, he probably is a favourite. I, I was quite interested by the AG2R team. I think... Carlos Betancur who, and uh, Domenico uh, Pozzovivo, who both rode well at the Giro, are both riding and, uh, you know, both very, very good climbers, um, could do well. Any, any, any thoughts about the Vuelta, Lionel? Well, I think it will be interesting to see how Sky get on with Sergio Henao and uh, he's going to be their designated leader for the race. Um, as we were saying before we started recording, the, we still don't know at this point whether Rigoberto Uran will be... Um, in that team specifically but I think looking at looking at the route looking at um, the fact that Nibali won the Giro Nibali, I forgot rest, about him. rested from the uh, rested from the tour in order to ride the Vuelta but is he riding it as preparation for the world championships or will he will he be going all out to try and win it it will be interesting to see Nibali apparently has also put on a bit of weight but not um, to focus on the time trial at the world's I think he's probably been too busy crafting those columns for Gazetta della Sport during the tour. That probably we can blame Chiro if we don't see <laughs> if we don't see a Nibali in top form. Orla, any thoughts on the Vuelta? Yeah, Nibali is the one that I'd be really interested to see how he gets on. Having covered the Giro, it was a little bit, in a way, disappointing as a fan to see that he wasn't really contested very much. There wasn't an awful lot of competition. Um, and he was imperious in the climbs. And given that this is such a mountainous um, Vuelta, I think I'd like to see just how he'll fare against the the likes of the, climbers. the, the, the pure climbers. Pots of Evil, I think, as you mentioned, given that he's so tiny, I think he's probably the, the lightest of, of all the climbers, one of the real pure climbers in the peloton. It'd be interesting to see how he does in that terrain. Um, but Dan Martin, I think, is one that came into the tour with such promise and I think would have really well, we know would have really liked to perform well in the GC, so I think he'd be trying to salvage some of um, his season from that, and I'd like to see him uh, do, you know, perform in some way in um, the Vuelta, it'd be interesting Maybe to even him. podium on such a mountainous uh, route, it's, it's possible he's, he's never really put together a really consistent tour, has he? That, that's the problem, and I had actually tipped him possibly for podium, certainly um, top five in the tour, and that just wasn't to be, but maybe given the fact that this is even more mountainous might play in his favour. Pozzo Vivo is a very talented uh, piano player as well and it'd be great to get some of his uh, piano playing as some soundtrack for a bit of the podcast, maybe work on that, get Chiro on the case for that. Well, Chiro's a man to, to get that done, isn't he? But he is. Just looking back at last year's Welter, <laughs> Um, looking back at last yeah, year's... He, he absolutely is. is. <laughs> of course he is, That's yeah. his speciality. Um, the top four last year were um, uh, were Contador, I forget the order now, but Contador, Rodriguez, Valverde, Froome. And they really were head and shoulders above everybody else. And it was a mountainous enough welter last year. And you got this sense, certainly middle of the race, that basically we know who the strongest four are, barring somebody getting ill or, or crashing. 
these four guys are going to just kind of keep edging away. I think we'll see a similar kind of race. I don't know who the riders will be, but it will be... Uh, the problem with these races where they are so mountainous is that the pattern is set on the first couple of days and then it's just repeated, really, day after day. Um, and maybe you lose one person every couple of days from, from the overall picture until there's just one, one guy left standing. And I, I think, you know, that's one of the tricky things when the organisers are trying to make a spectacle but it can backfire if they get a balance balance wrong you're listening to the Humans Invent Cycling Podcast powered by Sharp we are here in Golden Square in Soho and uh, it's very nice still table tennis or ping pong not quite sure what going on behind us we will investigate afterwards maybe have a little game Uh, we've got loads of questions I, I asked I put out uh, a tweet at half past ten last night. I realised that's a very good time to ask people questions. I don't know why, but I had a lot, a lot, some silly ones. Ned Bolting and uh, <laughs> Alistair McLennan, the president of Scottish Cycling, both very silly questions, but uh, but a lot of serious ones as well. Uh, Joff Furby uh, podcast question: Do I buy proper sunglasses or some ones like Ryder Hesjedal? Yes or no? Why not? Um, yes anything but the ones like Ryder Hedgedale which they're ridiculous aren't they they're don't get them couldn't couldn't disagree more boys could not disagree more you like them I loved them I thought they were great Def- definitely buy the Ryder glasses yeah ok uh, Stuart Barker <laughs> uh, what happens to the Tour de France bicycles that are actually used in the race that's a good question do you know Lionel what happens to them yeah uh, well I mean I, don't, I think they probably are still they, used at the yeah. end of the season the teams get rid of all the bikes they tend to yeah they tend to either this year's race bike becomes next year's training bike kind of thing, doesn't it, generally, is, uh, is, is one way that... that is that still the case? I well, thought they just flogged them all. Do they flog them all? They often flog you, them all, yeah, yeah oh, they often I'm flog bad. them all or, or donate them to charity, one oh, of the right. two, usually. Allegedly, Johan Brunil used to sell a lot of them during the season as well, <laughs> allegedly. So Sam Clark has asked about the lack of transfer activity at Team Sky and what actually has happened to Jonathan tiernan Lock. Well, the next question is on a similar vein. Yeah, indeed it is. It's from Paul Allen, and he said, 12 months ago, Jonathan Tiernanlock won the Tour of Britain. What's happened to him, or what's not happened to him? Transfer activity is odd in cycling. It's not like football, where there's a, there's a definite window. I suppose there is a definite window, but it's a much wider one, um, and it is open now. Um, but I don't... Uh, any, are we aware of any transfer activity? Well, the, the thing with Sky is that they, they are towards the more professional end of the teams aren't they? they they only announce something once it's done signed and sealed they don't really comment on anything there was a lot of rumors during the tour that they were in for one or two riders and none of those have, none of those have kind of come off yet iran but is away obviously uh, iran's leaving but uh, lawrence tendam was one that was was widely tipped by his, certainly the dutch press to join sky and and, and it doesn't look like that's happening because i think he's renewed he just with renewed Belgium, yeah so yeah. No, not aware. Jonathan Tiernan Locke, that, that is a curious one because yeah, when you think last year, he, he rode obviously well all season. It was his ride at the World Championships that really, really impressed me. You know, he was shadowing Alberto Contador there. That was the ride that made me think this guy can really go to World Tour level and, and do great things. And he, he just hasn't done it this year. It's always going to be hard for the likes of Jonathan Chain and Locke to step up to that, though, especially in the environment of Team Sky, which, is, has, some, which has some of the best riders in the world. I mean, we look at Alex Dyset, and he just had to, to leave to be able to make that next leap and went to Movistar to great success. Um, and so I think it was always going to be a difficult one. Um, in terms of what next for him, I understand that when he t- signed with Team Sky, it wasn't the highest offer on the table, so he could have gone for more money to another team, but he wanted the Team Sky environment and he wanted, I suppose, the British environment. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what he does next, but I do think it was always going to be a bit hard for him. There are lots of rumours about what's happened, that weight, you know, weight loss, he was, he was put on a diet to enable him to ride in Grand Tours and so on. Someone who's going to be joining us on perhaps our next podcast, um, but certainly a, a future one, will be Tom Southam who is quite close to Jonathan Tiernan Locke, he used to ride with him and, and is from the same neck of the woods. So perhaps uh, perhaps Tom can give us the real inside story of what's happened to Jonathan Tiernan Locke. From, from what I gather from the, pe- the, the British teams he rode for, uh, Plowman, Craven, Rafa, Endura, um, I would have, uh, from what I've gleaned about his personality is... Um, I couldn't think of a rider less suited to the way Team Sky runs the team, and with very, you know, like you say, put on a diet. You know, riders. It has to come from within the rider to to work the way that they want to work. And I'm not saying that that means that Jonathan Tiernan Locke's difficult or um, that Team Sky's 
approach is inflexible, but I just think they they don't really they don't really sit together. Certainly from the outside looking in, they don't sit together too happily. This one's got to be for you, Richard. Has any cyclist made you cry? This is from Alan Donald. Uh, has any cyclist made you cry, like after a particularly poignant or gutsy performance, or by being a big meanie to you? Yeah, I thought that might be a question for Orla. I mean, she's a uh, female, maybe more in touch with her emotions <laughs> than us, uh, you know, us, us, uh, us buttoned up men, you know. I can't think of, I can't think of, of a moment where I've ever cried. You know, as a fan, watching the tour as a, as a kid, perhaps the most emotional I, I ever was was in 1989 watching Robert Miller win at Super Banyer when he was away with Pedro Delgado. Um... I was really willing him to win that. It's been five years since he'd won a stage of the tour, and that's probably that's probably as emotional as I as I got. And I, 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 you know, I, I think um, as a journalist, I mean, lots of them have been big meanies to me, as I'm sure they have to you, Lionel, and and to you, Orla. Any not to you, Orla? Okay. Have any, have any of them made you cry? <laughs> I've wept tears of, of joy and distress on many an occasion at a bike race because I am female, so that's what we tend to do. No cyclist has ever made me cry either because of their fantastic performance or by being a big meanie. They're not always in the best form, but you know, to avoid them then, you don't put yourself in a position where you're going Who, to be... Who's the biggest sad. meanie? I'm not going to go there <laughs> because then they will make me cry next time just for the fun. Um, but no, I'm afraid I've never cried. Lionel, can you... Um, well, this is more a comment than this is more a comment on the previous oh, question. Yeah, Mark Colley says uh, Stephen Roach made me ha have tears of joy in 1987 when making up that time on Delgado in the Alps. Yeah, that was. Uh, and then someone else. Mark Al Mark Allen Wilkinson. Stephen Roach gave me a lift back to his hotel after Hope Var stage with Endura. I cried tears of fear. Yeah, I have heard Stephen Roach is a mad driver. They all yeah. are. They yeah. all are. I would say that the closest I've come to. Um, tears was the 89 tour as well after willing Greg Le Mans to win that race and beat Laurent Fignon and then seeing Le Mans joy on the Champs-Élysées and then I just had this real pang of regret for Laurent Fignon because he collapsed onto the onto the pavement and uh, you know he was he was distraught and I suddenly felt bad for kind of willing him to lose. I, really. But I don't think your willing of Greg Le Mans to win had any bearing on the actual <laughs> outcome. You may be right about that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, so it's quite poignant to think of us both as emotional basket cases back there in 1989. Our, you know, full I'm sure full of the usual teenage self-loathing and all the rest of it. It's, it's quite poignant just to think back to that, isn't I think it? In terms of um, more recent racing, I've, like I said, I've never never cried, but one of you must my, have. Well, maybe shed the odds here, but um, I've never needed the Kleenex. Let's say that much. But um, I think one of the most special. Goosebump moments, really, for me. Um, one of my most special days of covering cycling was last year, in the final day of the Tour de France, with the yellow jersey leading Mark Cavendish onto the Champs Elysees and him going on to win yet again. I think that was a really, really special moment. And I think just to be a little bit partisan, I must say, I am Irish, but seeing all the British fans along the Champs Elysees that day, it was, it was something that made me think that we're reaching a turning point in cycling and um, yeah I thought that was very special I nearly cried Does that linked, linked to that was Dominic O'Brien what's been your most memorable interviews for the wrong reasons or the right reasons that's a good question uh, what, what, what's what been your most memorable interview Lionel? well um, <coughs> after Beijing on the tour of Britain in 2008 um, why we did this I don't know but we, we decided a good idea would be to take Bradley Wiggins for a Chinese meal after the stage to Taunton I'm, I'm, I'm going red at the, at the memory of it we can see that it, <laughs> it was excruciating for a number of reasons um, the Chinese restaurant we chose wasn't the best um, the service was awful the food wasn't good Bradley, you could tell, was thinking, why am I having a Chinese meal with these guys? Um, the photographer didn't get it at all. We, it was for a magazine feature, and um, it, was, it, was a, it was a bad idea that got worse in the execution. But, you know, Bradley, I think, had sort of eight or nine bottles of beer that night and then, uh, then raced the stage the, the following day. Um, Ed Pickering, my Race colleague... And and, and well, Ed approach. Pickering and I, um, my colleague on Cycle Sport at the time, we stood on the first hill with hangovers and just were saying, how is he, he going to race 
because um, he had he'd had a couple more beers than we had. Perhaps and did the cycle sport expense account cover those eight or nine beers? Because I'm having trouble getting <laughs> getting some of my receipts uh, passed through their accounts department. These yeah, days. they they paid up for Bradley's beers. Yeah, um, and there he was on the back of the bunch, last man. I mean, that's not that wasn't unusual at the time because he often rode at the back of the bunch. Um, but he did give us a bit of a look as he went as he spotted us on the roadside. As if to say, you know, why did you let me drink all those beers? Yeah, yeah. Orla, any memorable interviews? What's what's been the most memorable interview for you? I'm trying to think what's been the wet, best or the worst. I don't think I've any ever had any terrible ones, although riders might tell you otherwise. Um, I think my most memorable is probably again with Bradley Wiggins for a very different reason. That was again after he finished the um, got the Olympic gold last year and we were supposed to interview him at some ungodly hour the day afterwards so we were told to be at a central London hotel overlooking St Paul's Cathedral and I think it was maybe half seven in the morning and I remember somebody telling me this and I saw his press conference um, from the evening before when he was sipping merrily on the vodka in front of the world's media and I thought that is never going to happen. Lo and behold, it didn't. So there was me up at the crack of dawn um, at this hotel, only to be told, actually, you know, um, Bradley's not feeling too good or whatever the excuse was. He'll be there at so, quarter to one. <laughs> yeah, no, it was actually quarter past seven in the evening uh, by the time we got the interview. Um, well, you just read the AM, uh, they got the AM, PM thing wrong. It was clearly my wrong. fault, yeah, yeah, it was clearly my error. Uh, but by the time we got him, it was just interesting to chat to him um, a man who has struggled, I think, with the media in the past and struggled with the attention and, and the pressure that comes with that, clearly relishing his position. And he was talking about how he'd taken his little son Ben down to Oxford Street to buy him a CD or something, a computer game. And um, he couldn't believe the crowds that were mobbing him. And I think it was, um, was it Putin's former bodyguard, I think, that they had employed for him for a while, which is quite spectacular. And it was just strange. It was just... Yeah, it was a special moment to see him embracing that, enjoying it, and really having fun. Um, so, yeah, that's probably... If one Wiggins had there. taken his top off, I'm sure it would have all been fine. <laughs> if it was Putin's ex-bodyguard. Um, my worst interview, I think, possibly, it's quite a recent one, Jürgen Vandenbroek last winter, uh, the, the Belgian rider, just absolutely appalling. He treated every question with suspicion. Um, it was a game, it ended up being a game that we were playing where it was, I was asking him questions knowing full well he wasn't going to answer them and, and it was almost as if we, were, we, we both ended up laughing at it, but it was dreadful. Um, and po- probably the best interview, uh, well Greg LeMond is, is always a great interview and I went over to interview him a couple of years ago for my book, Sling the Badger. A uh, little plug there, and uh, <laughs> ding, and uh, <laughs> and all. He's he's brilliant. I mean, if he's just he's just the most engaging guy who who will not shut up once he starts speaking. He he just will talk for hours and hours. And I I found that interview the other day. It's three and a half hours long. Uh, it was it was remarkable. Um, and also for that book as well, Paul Coachley, the uh, team director from the eighties, who was in charge of the Live Eclair team in '86. He's the most eccentric. Uh, person I've ever interviewed, he, I, I could only I could only phone him after dark, and I could only go and interview him after dark, and he wouldn't be pinned down to a particular day. I had to sort of be in the area and be aw- be available to go and turn up at his house. And the the guys who are making a, a film at the moment based on that on that story of the '86 tour have had just had exactly the same experience. They had they were instructed to be in the area and after dark go and pay him a visit. He was a maverick character, though, wasn't he? Mm. Um, uh, he was the team director for Eno and Le Mans, the Lavie Claire team, 86. He put together really cycling's kind of modern super team, didn't he? Yep. And, uh, and he encouraged the riders in that team, as you, as you wrote in your book, to, um, to be almost individuals who made up the team. You know, they, they, never, they never rode in the front. They never rode as a yeah. team on the front. They, were, they made the racing every day. Their, the tactic was to have different people you know, attacking every day. But and the way that he understood bike racing, his cupboards full of videotapes of races was just remarkable and a real a real thinker a real maverick and uh, really really fascinating once he started talking about his his strategy and his tactics the cycling podcast with humansinvents.com innovation craftsmanship and design i'm with orla chinawi and lionel burney i'm richard moore and we're going to rattle through a few more questions uh, rob snedden asks is it more important to give young riders a first chance than giving ex-dopers a second chance? Very good question, Lionel. It is a good question, but I'd say it's probably 
a question that was a bit more relevant maybe a year or two ago. Every year we just move forward a little bit more and things get, a, you know, the, the culture is shifting with every passing season. Um, a couple of years ago, Jonathan Vorters gave Thomas Decker a second chance. He, he, he'd been a doper at the Rabobank team and he offered him a way back into the sport. Um, I don't necessarily see that happening as much now, but then, you know, there haven't been as many high profile um, doping cases in, in recent years. I mean, and the, uh, in, in the last sort of 18 months or so, other than kind of the, the repeat offenders like Danilo De Luca. Um, so I, I think the, the culture of the sport is changing so that there are going to be less riders who will need a second chance. You know, we know it's not going to be eradicated entirely, but there are now riders who, as, as lots of people in the sport will tell you, they're not even coming into contact with doping in the same way that even even a generation ago or half a generation ago, riders were having to negotiate their way through a really murky sport. It's, there are teams now where it just isn't it isn't an issue, and they're they're not going to be placed in a position where they're going to have to go cap in hand for a second chance. This links to a couple of the other questions that we were asked. Jason Dobson uh, asked, are we to believe any of the recent performances given the doping rev- revelations by members of dope-free teams? He may be talking about um, the news uh, from uh, Garmin Sharp that Andreas Clear uh, has admitted to doping and, and accepted a six-month ban. He's retired. He retired this year, but he's now a director on the team. Uh, and Mikhail Kadil, sorry if I've pronounced the name incorrectly, I think you're Polish, um, are we uh, are we who believe that cycling is now as clean as ever in history fools romantic or probably right? Um, that that also is a really good question, um, and I think uh, I'm sort of loath to come down with any definitive answer to that, but probably edging towards probably right. I think cycling is clean. Interesting. I've just been at the World Athletics Championships in Moscow, and that. Doping was a big topic there as well, and my feeling is that athletics is about five or six years behind cycling, uh, just in the way that the topic is discussed. And my sense of, you know, I think that, that that what's happening now in athletics is comparable to what was happening in cycling around about 2006, 2007. Uh, and I, I was quite struck, having come from the Tour de France and s- listened there to how how riders and teams now talk about doping. Just the way that it was being discussed, I'll not mention any names, but by some very high-profile athletes, I was pretty stunned that they were um, as evasive as they were. Uh, another, another good question from uh, Chris Cristofano asks, uh, is Kittel the new Christophe Basson, Marcel Kittel? Uh, and he says he'll save his 20 other doping-related questions for when we talk about doping in a little bit more detail. Um, but... I think the question there links to uh, Kittel has taken a polygraph uh, test, a lie detector test, to prove that he is clean and he he passed it. Um, Orla, what were your thoughts on Kittel doing that? I think it's... Well, it's interesting. It's obviously a bit of a gimmick. I understand that the magazine asked 20 German riders to come forward and Kittel was the only one who did. Read into that what you will. Kittel obviously isn't the new Basson because the the culture within cycling has changed so much. He's not putting his neck on the line anymore. Um, But I think that in the context of... There was another question um, from Jimmy P. Asked, as fans of sporting spectacle, is doping relevant? And I think it is very relevant in the context of German riders and the blanket ban that German media has on cycling. And I think if doping wasn't so much of an issue obviously then those riders wouldn't have to go through these gimmicks and yeah I think that um, I think it's good that Kittel is doing what he can I think the danger then is that we start to say well everyone should do absolutely everything to prove um, the absence of a a negative a positive test which obviously isn't practical it isn't um, sensible either but it's a difficult position, I think, for the German riders in particular. But I remember someone asking me on Twitter, should this be the new pre-Tour de France test that everyone has to go through a lie detector test? And I think that would be absolutely ridiculous. Would have Jeremy Kyle as the new UCI president if that were the case. <laughs> as somebody pointed out, I think Tyler Hamilton passed a lie detector test. Indeed. Sorry, I've, I've just been, been reminded of Pierre Roland um, by a girl over there uh, wearing a, a polka dot dress. Um, anyway... Um, <laughs> 
sorry to uh, a bit of a tangent, but um, Tyler Hamilton passed a lie detector yeah. test, so they're not they're not infallible. Um, it was a huge risk, I think, for Kittel to, to take. Um, imagine if he'd failed the, the lie detector test, he would then have given himself a real a real problem. So, you know, fair play to him for doing it. I mm-hmm. think uh, he, you know, make you know making it as you say, it's a gesture uh, and it's a positive gesture. Um, Kittel has, though, beyond that, been one of the most outspoken writers. All the Germans are, to be fair, Andre Greipel uh, was on Twitter yesterday um, asking for any other you know, former writers who've got skeletons in their closets to please come out now and, and say it, because he recognises the, the damage that is being done by these, these continued revelations. Somebody did make the comment, though, that you know Andreas Clear has, has, has admitted being a professional cyclist in the 1990s, which was a, 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 a flippant way of um, uh, making the point that you know, Clear is no different to a lot of riders of that generation. Um, the difference is that with, with Jonathan Waters, the way he's run his team, I, from what I gather... Jonathan would have been aware of Andreas Clear's past before he hired him because one of the conditions is that he will stand by his man as long as the revelations when they come out aren't a surprise to him. He's so, honest, he, yeah, so he's yeah. he's he's running a kind of, you know, it, there are people who have been critical of this policy, but I think in order to run a clean operation, you have to know the background of your. Um, your staff and if, if Jonathan n- knew the background of his staff which we have to assume he did and now he's, he's choosing to stand by clear um, I think you know that, that's, a, that, that's an effective way of, of, of actually moving things forward and, and making sure that the team in the present is run as a clean credible organisation and, uh, yeah, and, I mean it's a unique case Garmin Sharp I think you know, yeah. John Favorte is effectively running his own Truth and Reconciliation Commission. He is. And, he? and what would be the point of Andreas Clear? What he wouldn't been encouraged to say to Jonathan Vorters, um, you know, this is what I did in the past. If that then, the, if the, impl- the if the consequences of that were meant that he wouldn't have a job. I mean, there, there's you've got to offer people going back to the second chance um, thing. I'd kind of read that as meaning riders, but of course. We have got this two tiers thing where yesterday's dopers are today's team managers, and and I think that it's important and that that, that there are enough teams out there who are um, policing things in this kind of way and saying, look, we can't change what happened in 2000 or 2001 or whenever it was, um, but what we can do is, is change how things are being being done today. So. You know, I think you have to be kind of grown up about it rather than having a, a, a thick black line that says, right, if you did this in the past, there's no place for you in the sport, because I don't think it's, that's It's practical. very tricky, isn't it? Th- this should not actually be the responsibility of the teams, and this, this is where the, the governing body has really let the sport down and continues to let the sport down. Teams are in charge of setting their own policies on this very, very serious issue. And, you know, Team Sky obviously have a very different policy, um, but they're both essentially trying to achieve the same thing, which is to have clean teams. Uh, you know, the difference between Jonathan Vorters and Dave Brailsford is that Jonathan Vorters comes from this world. He understands it in a way that I think Dave Brailsford didn't. Certainly he perhaps does more now, but he, he didn't. And, and so not coming from that world, not having the history that Jonathan Vorters has meant that he was able to set up and try and run his team in a different way. Um, it's open to all, all kinds of criticism and, and comment, but they are essentially trying to achieve the same thing. Um, and I think that what, what we're what we're what we're missing here is a is a strong governing body who is who's setting the rules about you know, and, and policies and procedures for this, um, and that's the that that's the problem. And we'll probably come back to that at some point as well with the UCI presidential race uh, coming up. Way too busy joining cycling federations around the world, isn't he? So. <laughs> he is uniting them. He's he is uniting them. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Just we'll we'll go through another couple of quick questions. Uh, Chris Stefano again. What is the best book ever written about cycling? Oh, Richard, Arla. you really want me to say one of yours, don't you? <laughs> I, I would love you to, but um, no, I'd rather you didn't actually. No, actually, the first cycling book I ever read was yours. It was oh, don't. Heroes, villains, and Ve- heroes, villains, and velodromes, which I thought was a very interesting book. Um, in terms of the best, um, if you That's like. Not it. If you, <laughs> it was my first though okay. that still you know yeah, yeah. it ranks somewhere I think if you like your Tour de France I think Alice Bacon's recent book on the tour is absolutely fantastic Mapping the Tour Mapping the Tour it's a brilliant sort of encyclopedia dip in dip out encyclopedia of the tour um, 
William Fotheringham's recent tour book as well. I loved it. It's a collection of his articles over the years, and I find it really, really readable. Uh, my favourite, though, has to be, um, speaking of, unfortunately, former dopers, Michael Barry's Le Metier. It's one of the most beautiful books I've ever read, never mind cycling books. It's so poetic, uh, beautifully written. It's one of the books that if you're new to cycling and you don't understand why these riders, or like me, you've never raced competitively, you don't understand why these guys put and and women put themselves through the pain, the torture, the mundanity of training day in, day out. Reading his book really gets you into the psyche of that, the beauty of it. It's a fantastic book I'd recommend to anyone, whether you're a sports fan or not. I loved it. Lionel? I, I reread Jeffrey Nicholson's uh, The Great Bike Race just before the tour uh, and was struck by its sort of simplicity, really. It re kind of reawakened some of the things about the tour that you forget or you, you don't notice when you're so immersed in it. And just, uh, I think there, there's scope for a kind of modern version of that, ju- stripping, stripping back. Yeah. It's um, due a reprint, isn't it? I mean, I it, it, it covers yeah, the 76 tour. 70, is it 76 or 77? 76. 76, that's yeah. right, yeah. Um, Lucien Bennett. And, but Yeah, but the tour, the, the actual, the way the tour unfolds itself, it was, as you said before, it was a fairly unremarkable tour. It mm. wasn't one that sticks in the memory. Uh, clearly, I couldn't remember which one it was even. But um, <laughs> just from, from somebody who's been around the modern tour, um, following it, the great circus day by day as it packs up and moves on, um, it's a... It's a story of a much kind of simpler, perhaps a little bit more elegant uh, event, and certainly a more French event than, mm. it, than it is these days. And, and uh, I, I really enjoyed reading that again. Yeah, and, and it's, a, it's a lovely, slender little book that yeah. you will pay quite a lot of money for to, to get at the moment, and it's, I think it is due a reprint. Mm. Um, I'll nominate, uh, well, you might have mentioned Wide Eyed and Legless as well, which is one of the first cycling books I read back in 1987. It covers ANC Halford's. Uh, Tour de France in 1987 it was republished recently very good, Jeff Connor uh, very funny um, uh, also I was a big fan of uh, Tour de Force, the, the Dan Coyle book about, about Lance Armstrong which came out following the uh, 2004 season, thought that was excellent I mentioned Daniel Freib's The Cannibal um, his Eddie Merckx biography which I think is, is a really really great book um, and I think I'll mention also uh, um, Charlie Wigelius' uh, Domestique, which is which came out this year, and as I said earlier, we'll have Tom Sutherland. Tom helped uh, Charlie write it, and they're good friends. They go back a long way, and it's a really, really good book. Um, really thoroughly recommended. And I think that's pro- that'll probably do us for for tonight. Oh, there's a, there's one that we can finish on, uh, Vanilla Thriller. Uh, who is and who isn't worth following on Twitter? I've deleted Twitter from my phone, and it's been a breath of fresh air. I thought you'd so, been quiet recently. Yeah, it just, um, I'm living in the real world, you know. What? I know, it's amazing. <laughs> so you've lost all that weight, living in the real world. <laughs> Cycling and living in the real world, it's, wow. it's doing me the world of good. Orla? I would say Inner Ring is a very good um, Twitter follower, um, does a great blog for the Grand Tours, um, so that would be one of my top tips. Race Radio, give a shout out to Race Radio, is very well informed with uh, what's going on. A lot of the stuff that he says uh, turns out to be true. Um, I met Race Radio actually at the tour this year. Um, he's got a real name as well. Uh, he's not called actually called Race Radio, uh, but I'll, 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 I'll preserve the, uh, the disguise, the cloak of anonymity that is Race Radio. Um, anyone, he, say, he, does, he does ask who isn't worth following as well. I mean, quite a lot of riders over the years I've unfollowed just because they're, a lot of their tweets tend to, towards the banal well I mean that's what Twitter's for really isn't it let's be <laughs> honest, self promotion and the banal um, I think riders <laughs> tweets are generally worth following anyway I think if you want to get a little bit of gossip and you want to know um, you know what's happening they're still, I think they're more guarded than they used to be yeah, but I think I, it's still worth following I think I'll give a shout out to Danny Pate who is a seldom twi- twitterer but when he does tweet it's usually it's something either funny or very pointed and on that note David Miller I think is a classic tweeter as well He does. he's careful with his tweets and I think when he tweets <laughs> they're usually um, entertaining or informative So, in yeah. that case I'll add Daniel Lloyd who I think yeah, is Daniel yeah. Lloyd one mm. um, the ex-rider um, just funny grounded <laughs> person who's living in the real world like yourself Lionel <laughs> also very slim 
that's all for, for today then. Thank you very much, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Orla. It's been a pleasure, thank you. We're off to play table tennis. <laughs> Bing bong.